Thank you for joining us for this event. My name is Tina Merrill and I'm a manager at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. Please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. One of the many great events we're looking forward to is Dan Matthews in conversation with Alex Ebert on Tuesday, September 29th. These two authors will be in conversation about Dan's new book, Like Crazy, Life with My Mother and Her Invisible Friends. Right now, we're honored to welcome Jewel Parker Rhodes and Kelly McWilliams to discuss their books, Black Brother, Black Brother, and Agnes at the End of the World. Jewel Parker Rhodes is the author of Ninth Ward, winner of a Coretta Scott King honor, Sugar, winner of Jane, the Jane Addams Children's Book Award, and the New York Times bestselling Ghost Boys. She has also written many award-winning novels for adults. When she's not writing, Jewel visits schools to talk about her books and teaches writing at Arizona State University. Kelly McWilliams is a mixed race writer who has always gravitated towards stories about crossing boundaries and forging new identities. For this and so many other reasons, young adult literature will always be close to her heart. Her novel, Agnes at the End of the World, benefited from a We Need Diverse Books mentorship. She lives in Colorado with her partner and young daughter. This event today will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. If someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting Jewel Parker Rhodes, Kelly McWilliams, and Powell's by purchasing a copy of their books. A link to buy the books will be shared in the chat today. Jewel and Kelly, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to have you. We'll have a great event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Powell's, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's such a pleasure. Uh, for Kelly and I, it's also lovely to see each other because we haven't seen each other since Labor Day of last year in person. Uh, so this is like mother-daughter reunion too, as well as books. But I am so proud of, of Kelly. Um, Agnes at the End of the World is a marvelous book, but I wanted to ask Kelly, why do you write for YA? Wow, thank you. It makes me blush every time you say that, but <laughs> I'll just give a little introduction in case we have folks on who don't know. Um, I'm a young adult author, and this is my first book since um, I published a book as a 15 year old. Um, so I'm considering it sort of my debut where I'm really cognizant of what's going on. And um, <laughs> Jewel writes amazing books for middle grade, and I've seen that journey for you. Um, this book, Agnes at the End of the World, is the story of a 16 year old girl who escapes from a cult, um, a fundamentalist cult, only to discover that the world outside has been ravaged by a terrible pandemic. Um, it came out June 9th. I started working on it about three years ago. Um, and I think that I keep coming back to writing for young adults because it's a time of identity formation. Um, it's a time of such important exploration, um, making choices, sort of do I stay with my community, with my ideologies, or do I, you know, make a new life for myself? And as a sort of mixed race person, I feel like I'm constantly navigating boundaries and those sorts of issues work their way into the book. Um, I'm fascinated by how much change takes place during our teenage years. And um, I wanted to write a book showing young adults that um, the sky's the limit, really. The first sentence of the book after the prologue is, are you in rebellion? And so it's a book that I hope encourages young people to be rebellious and adventurous and to explore and to take risks because there's no better time to do it than when you're a teenager. <laughs> That's great. And though, of course, as a parent, you know, I, know. You I heard it. I heard the scary. I heard the scary. Yeah, I heard it kind of double back. <laughs> like well wow. <laughs> um, <risk>. yeah <laughs> Kelly, Kelly was certainly rebellious when she was a teen uh, and she's still rebellious and when you read the book you'll know that it it's it's the connotation is always it's 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 a good thing to question to challenge and not to accept you know or just assimilate because it's part of the conformity and so it's really really wonderful uh, but Kelly has a four-year-old daughter and I gotta say as 
the grandmother. I can't see what Kelly thinks about it when her daughter is, re is in rebellion. That'll be fun. Um, I write for middle grade, Kelly, the same way for you write for YA, because I think a lot of change happens for the middle grade kid. You know, for me, that's always a classic rite of passage novel where children are going from being children to becoming the young men and women that they will be. And in particular, I love seeing fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And you can see in their faces that sort of like bridge between being the child and being the adult that they will become. I also think I like to write about middle grade because um, that's a part of my childhood that I don't remember very much. In fact, there's a lot about my childhood that I simply don't remember. So I think in some ways for me writing about middle grade is I think I'm nurturing myself in reverse uh, and enjoying that sort of sense of discovery and that optimism and the empathy that middle grade kids have um, and their goofiness and yet their intelligence. So for me, it just feels right. But when I started writing for youth with Ninth Ward, I actually thought that was a YA novel. And then they told me, no, 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 this is a middle grade. The publishers told me. Um, so it does seem to me that I just gravitate always to middle grade. I think I would have a hard time writing a young adult book. Yeah, I think that's true for a lot of authors. And I just wanna make sure that you get a chance to do a nice introduction for Black Brother, Black Brother, which um, is one of my favorite books that you've ever written. I loved Ninth Ward. And I remember the day that Ninth Ward was born. Um, we as a family, we grew up in Arizona, but we were always very connected to New Orleans. Um, it was a, a, the place of our imagination and, um, you know, a place where we had taken interesting vacations. And it's um, when Katrina happened, I remember you watching, watching that and deciding that now was the time to write your first middle grade book, because before that you had actually been frightened to write for children. Um, but I went wild, frightened, maybe a little bit too strong, but yeah, probably I was frightened. I well, think what I remember was you used to say, uh, you know, I, I'm right, I'm, I have to get good enough to write for children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. And uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, I wrote, started writing my first novel really when I was like in my early 20s. And that was Voodoo Dreams, an adult novel about um, a hoodoo woman in Louisiana. And that didn't get published until I was 33. And in fact, uh, it became a published novel because of my daughter. The novel had received lots of rejections. And I remember I thought about giving up. Kelly was born and she was in her cradle. And I thought, well, how can I tell her to pursue her dreams if I don't pursue mine? And I went back to writing Voodoo Dreams and it took me several years and then several more years for it to find a publisher. And then finally it was published. But in truth, all that time, what I really wanted to write about was youth. And I wanted to write for youth. I feel that young people deserve the very, very best. And so I didn't want to do my first novel writing for young people. I wanted to become, as Kelly said, good enough to write for children. So I had my own kids to practice on in the sense that, you know, I could make up stories, we could read books, uh, and I bought tons of tons of books, and I kept waiting and waiting. And it wasn't until Hurricane Katrina hit that finally the voice of a child came to me. And all of a sudden the floodgates opened and there was a story. I think for me, all of my stories have to start with the sense of voice, that the main characters are never about me. They're always about the inspiration that I find in real children that I end up meeting. And in Black Brother, Black Brother in particular, I have two brothers. I have Dante and Trey and Dante, um, is younger by a few years, but Dante's skin color presents his block to the world. And his brother, Trey, um, his skin color presents as being white. And this is actually based upon 
my own family story. So I was a little bit surprised that I got so personal in terms of dealing with colorism in this book, but I did in fact go there. And I think writing Ghost Boys, you know, about the murder of young black boys by police in terms of bias and racism sort of enabled me to make that further connection that racism not only tears apart families, people of color, but it also tears apart multi-ethnic families, which seems uh, so um, anti-American to me that my daughter, Kelly, looks like her dad and my son looks like me. And given the way that they would treat the people of color so differently than, you know, Kelly and her dad, it was really as though the world was like, no, you don't belong together. You don't go together, you know, and people would often question whether Kelly was in fact her brother's sister. So in Black Brother, Black Brother, these two boys who are not based on my children, but inspired by them, they demonstrate that their bond as siblings is so tight. And so even the unfairness of how the world sees them doesn't then rip them apart. And in fact, that works out for the whole family. So I do like Black Brother, Black Brother very, very, very much. And it is in some ways the most personal of my books. I was um, so excited when I heard the premise for this story because it was an ongoing conversation sort of in our in my childhood or something that I certainly think about a lot that, you know, I was three years older than my brother and um, the way that say a private school would treat me would be so different from the way that he would be treated. And it was in some ways just deeply heartbreaking. I still remember those days when someone would come up to us in the grocery store and, you know, really adults would like insist to me as a child that I couldn't possibly be related to my brother. Um, and so it was, it was lovely to see some of those wounds explored in such an uplifting way. Um, what Jewel hasn't said yet is that Black Brother, Black Brother is also her first sports novel. So if you have middle grade readers um, who love sports, this is all about a fencing competition is where Dante finds his strength and self-determination. And it's, it's so, it's beautifully illustrated fencing and it's, it's just a wonderful and exciting story too. Well, Kelly McWilliams, thank you very much. <laughs> um, for those of you who, who have been reading my children's books, they I think that they all tend to be very, very different. And I was shocked that I was writing a, uh, a sports novel. But it is um, apropos. Sometimes my books have a very long gestation. And I remember being a teen discovering in the Smithsonian Magazine, Alexander Dumas, the guy who wrote The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, that he was actually a black man, a black Frenchman. It was like, what? And here's a secret. I have always, always, always loved swords, samurai swords, you know, Arthurian legend swords. I love swords. Um, so I always wanted to, to fence. And what I discovered is that Alexander Dumas, he was actually writing his novels based on his dad, who was known as the Black Count, that his father was the, the son of a Haitian slave and a French aristocrat. And he was also the general for Napoleon's army. And he was just famous and fabulous, you know, the great, you know, warrior. And I think as I do about my entire growing up years of how having the lack of representation affected choices, affected identity. And so one of the things that happened that connected in 19... Night, well, the ninth, the Brazil Olympics, I forget what year that was, maybe five years ago now, that the American team was primarily, a fencing team was primarily Asian and Black, you know, or biracial kids. And that was due to one man named Peter Westbrook, who had won awards in fencing as a Black, he's Black Asian man years ago. And he started a school in New York where anybody could come and, you know, for free, they could learn how to fence. And he has since then had most of the sort of major national and international and Olympic champions come from his studio. So I got to finally write a story um, where kids fence and a wonderful girl fences too. So my book is kind of like colorism meets 
karate kid with that sense of triumph um, and sportsmanship. It also has, and then I'm gonna stop talking, Kelly, um, connects with the school to prison pipeline. When I was writing Ghost Boys, um, I found out about the school to prison pipeline and I couldn't fit it in about the murder, the police bias and racism against, you know, people like Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, and historically Emmett Till. So I saved the school to prison pipeline for Black Brother, Black Brother. Children of color from kindergarten up through high school are punished disproportionately compared to white students. They are suspended disproportionately. There are even examples, say a black kid who was getting free lunch and he forgot his milk and he went back to get his milk um, and they arrested him. There was a recent video on YouTube of a five-year-old girl who was considered sassy and they were literally trying to put handcuffs on her and take her off to jail. And she's just crying, please don't take me to jail. Please don't take me to jail. And once a child gets involved with the criminal justice system, they're less likely to graduate high school and they're more likely to actually end up in prison as adults. So one of the things that happens in Black Brother, Black Brother, among the many things, is that Dante uh, is unjustly accused and he is in fact carted off to prison. Okay, so now I'll be hush. So Kelly- oh, Wonderful, I, I was gonna say, I just wanted to piggyback off the Alexander Dumas story and also encourage anyone with any questions for either Jewel or myself to um, enter it in the Q&A box. We love audience questions. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, so the I'm writing my next book is set in the sort of the Jim Crow South in Jim Crow, Georgia. And it's about two twin sisters, one light enough to pass and one who's obviously black and how they're separated at birth after the murder of their parents. And so I was doing research for this project and I was reading um, oral histories collected from the time because there aren't so many written histories as you would really expect. So essentially uh, the University of North Carolina went to all these people's porches, you know, in, in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, all throughout the South and said, what do you remember about Jim Crow? And they did this project in like, you know, the 80s and one of the men sitting on his porch said you know well I just thought it was so crazy that they hid from us <laughs> that Alexander Dumas the author of Three Musketeers was a black man and it's like those things you know don't happen by accident is what he was putting together he was putting it together with segregation and with the larger oppressive system there's a reason that there's been so little representation for so many years and um it was just funny because I knew that you were working on Black Brother Black Brother at the time that I was reading this and you know to this day it's not common knowledge mm -hmm. um so my my book is really about a girl who has to liberate herself from a cult that is loosely based on the fundamentalist church of latter-day saints not to be confused with the latter-day saints in any way the mormon church um this was like a fringe cult and identified by the fbi as a cult um based in northern arizona and utah which was very close to where i grew up and I, I remember seeing this footage, the FBI came onto the compound to try and rescue the girls and women. These were polygamous marriages. There were many, many children. Medicine was forbidden, um, so kids were dying. And the FBI came and, and said, you know, we're gonna get the women and children off the compound and they refused to leave. And so to me, I became just very fascinated in the power of that brainwashing and that mind control um, that these women would make these choices to stay. Every single one of them was, was crying and screaming and saying, I wanna say, stay. And so I just was fascinated in exploring this journey um, of, a, of a girl very much based on Carolyn Jessup's memoir, Escape, um, who was able to do the very hard work of decolonizing her mind and liberating herself from this cult. So there is a real woman who did this, who wrote you know, an amazing memoir that I encourage everyone to read, Escape, Carolyn Jessup. She was the first woman to ever escape the FLDS church with all of her children. And for Agnes, you know, one of her motivations to leave is it's also a child. Her brother Ezekiel, who she has a caregiving role for, has type one diabetes, and he's not going to survive in this cult without insulin. Now, when she runs, she's also confronted by this pandemic 
um, which I actually think in some ways was inspired by Hurricane Katrina as well. These, this great force outside of her control. Um, she expects this wonderful outside world and this place to welcome her with open arms and this place where Ezekiel can finally be free and you know go to school with other children and have the medicine he needs. And um, she just runs at exactly the wrong time. And um, that's sort of the journey that really? the explores. But it was also inspired by your Zika scare too, that you were in a sense living among another health emergency. That's true. Uh, people ask me sort of um, like, how did you wind up writing a pandemic novel that releases during a pandemic? Because one of the things about publishing is it takes books a long time to be produced. I started Agnes three years ago. I started it when I was pregnant with my daughter. And what was very much on my mind was this, this cult and these sort of images from my childhood that I was thinking about and working through. And then also I was living in Honolulu at the time, a tropical location. Um, and we had the mosquitoes that could spread the Zika virus. And I was watching the epidemic unfold in Latin America. And I was getting these, um, you know, notifications on NPR, you know, pregnant women, you know, avoid standing bodies of water, like cover yourself in mosquito repellent. I wouldn't be surprised if Clara still hates the smell of mosquito repellent. Um, it was terrifying. And it gave me just the, the tiniest glimpse of how a public health emergency can really turn the world upside down. Um, so that was something that I wanted to explore was how could she work through the sort of, you know, the double trauma of being a cult escapee and then escaping into a world that is struggling. Um, and I didn't expect it to have the resonance that it, it has now. Um, but I'm sort of glad that it's out there because it's a, it's a very hopeful book. It's a book about how we survive, you know, as long as we believe we can and um, how we can sort of fight for the greater good together. And teens especially need that. So many of their dreams have been put on hold or opportunities put on hold. Uh, so I love them having that image of that fighting spirit, that rebellious spirit of Agnes, who really goes on to make wonderful things happen. If any of you are fans of Octavia Butler, um, you'll also uh, find sort of like that glow of an Octavia Butler salvation in Agnes at the end of the world. But Kelly, also talk about, before, before you read, about you have actually two main characters. I have two brothers, Dante and Trey, but Dante pretty much tells a story. You have two sisters, and they both tell the story. Yes, it's from a dual perspective. So Agnes and her sister Beth narrate the story. Um, Agnes escapes in time and Beth gets trapped and left behind in the cult. And then the story is very much all about how they make their way back to each other um, and how they sort of battle through layers of ideology to find common ground again after they're separated. Um, thank you for the comparison to Octavia Butler. The Parable of the Sower was by and far um, the biggest inspiration, textual inspiration for this book. Um, Agnes is a character that I look up to to this day as a role model, you know, whereas Beth is, is more, um, she's more fun loving. Like I always say, Agnes, her greatest wish is for world peace. And Beth wants a lower back tattoo. Um, <laughs> like, had to get this cult and like live her life. And they made, you know, great foils. And but through this pandemic, I, I've really been looking up to Agnes because, you know, she escapes this traumatic situation. She realizes the world is not as she was promised it might be. And she decides to create her own world. Um, and I see a lot of kids doing that. I see sort of Zoom education taking off. I see that we're sort of pivoting in these incredible ways and kids are managing to say, like, I just saw a house down the road that said, honk, it's my birthday. And people were like, you know, driving by and doing this honking birthday for this little boy. And um, so it is a pandemic novel and I'm very, very sorry, but it is a hopeful pandemic novel. And I highly recommend it to teenagers. If you have teenagers in your house, um, who are working through sort of what it means to be going through a time like this. Um, I think Agnes is a good choice. Or if you are a teenager, uh, we might have teenagers watching us right now, which is awesome. But Kelly, do you mind reading from the beginning of your book? I can, and then we'll have you read your section. I'll just read my prologue. Here's Agnes at the end of the world. Once a girl lived in a double wide trailer on ranch land beneath a wide white sky tumbled with clouds. The prophet, a scowling crow of a man, presided over everyone and everything. 
When the girl wasn't praying or busy with chores, she'd spin in meadows dancing with bees and dandelions until father called her name from the porch, Agnes, back in the house, run. In Agnes's world, secular music was forbidden, as was television, radio, and all technologies of sin. She wore homemade dresses that draped every inch of skin, though they were far too hot. At 12, boys and girls were forbidden to play together, and the prophet called the children little sinners with a sneer. Nevertheless, Agnes loved her world, loved the meadow and the rocky canyon and the hawks that screeched overhead, winging impossibly high. One day, the meadow spoke. She was dancing when the hum rose up through the bottoms of her feet and into her small little girl bones. It was like a song, an old song. She pressed her ear to the ground and listened. Rocks pulsed, stones echoed, and clouds, trees, leaves rustled with melody. The girl smiled, her heart full, because God had opened her ears. He'd scratched the earth with his fingernail and revealed a hidden world. The girl was too young to see the danger in being singled out in a land where the prophet expected his faithful to march like paper dolls, arm in arm and all the same. Perfect obedience produces perfect faith. In Sunday school, Mrs. King asked the children if they remembered to pray. I don't need to pray, said Agnes, because God is singing everywhere all the time. Children snickered. Their teacher swiftly crossed the room. She grabbed Agnes's arm, her face purple with anger, and stretched it across the desk. Then she slammed a Bible spine across the girl's knuckles over and over until the middle knuckle of her right hand cracked like a nut. Pain exploded up her arm. She knew better than to scream. The woman bent and poured poison into her ear. Insolent child, only the prophet hears the voice of God. Lie again and I'll show you real pain. That night, hand throbbing and swollen, the girl told herself she didn't hear the sky singing or the earth humming, that she'd never heard such lovely evil things. Never, never. Perfect obedience produces perfect faith. Agnes pretended so hard not to hear that one day she didn't. The world went silent, all songs snuffed out like a candle flame. When she returned, hesitant and barefoot to the bee spun meadow, she heard nothing, nothing at all. Oh, so, <laughs> so lovely. Um, but um, in terms of your affirmation, which you and I both write, I think finally, affirming stories you know I do think that that metaphor of she didn't hear the singing the singing that was of God the singing that was the spiritual essence that that's what blooms by the end of the novel you know that 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 voice and being alive to uh, the voice in the world nicely done Kelly Ellie yeah I will say one more thing and then I'm gonna let you take over yeah for for Agnes the book um it's in some ways about faith but it's perspective, there's, a, there's an atheist love interest. It's perspective is very much that it, it doesn't matter what you put faith in. It could be that you put faith in public health me measures, in sourdough bread, in your family, in your loved ones, um, but whatever it is that you put faith in will buoy you through difficult times, so. Well said, well said. Um, hmm. my, my, um, my book, Black Brother, I'll give you the setup. Dante um, has been uh, carted off to jail. He's actually bullied by Alan, who is the captain of the fencing team and thinks he's, you know, hot stuff at this Middlefield, Middlefield Preparatory School. Um, and Alan likes to mock uh, Dante by, by chanting Black Brother, Black Brother, um, as opposed to his real brother, whom, you know, he's the white, therefore good brother. So when Dante is suspended, everybody's, you know, gone off to work, gone off to school, and he takes a walk in his neighborhood, and it's a snowy day, and that's on purpose, um, and it starts like this. Black brother is all Middlefield prep can see. Then there's me. Skin color is just a part of me. I squat right on the sidewalk, feeling crazy, overcome. It hurts to think for Alan, a kid like me, my inside self, doesn't matter. I panic, I've got to stand. Someone might call the police. 
black brother. Words are being carried by the wind. No one else but me can hear it. My mind is blown. Alan wanted other students to see only my blackness, see it as a stain. I remember Alan's contorted, electrified face yelling at me outside the police car. Like I conjured it, a squad car turns the corner. Turning too fast toward home, I slip. My hand lands on the ice. I stagger up. The patrol car slows. My heart races. Two officers stare. I push my hood away from my face. Let them see me. Let them know I've nothing to hide. Sirens blare. I freeze. Red and blue lights flash. My heart beats fierce. I want to run faster than I've ever run before. But something horrible might happen. Exhaling, I close my eyes, waiting to be arrested. The siren's wail becomes more distant. Amazingly, the black and white speeds down the street. Crime must be elsewhere, or maybe not. Maybe it's another black kid walking on the street, on the road, just walking, trying to mind his own business, like me. It's really interesting how in writing, you always try to use the kind of language that mirrors your characters. It's organic uh, to your characters. Uh, so my language is very direct very short being that of a 14 year old boy. And your novel, Kelly, has this wonderful lyricism that sort of speaks to this interior of this sort of, you know, thinking, feeling, you know, sort of very spiritually centered young girl. Uh, but that's one thing for those of you writers that are out there, every novel should be different in how, in how you write it. And it's generally based on literally the voice of the character. I have always felt that that was true. And I wait, um, it usually takes about three to six months for me to nail the voice. Um, and after that, everything I think gets a lot easier. So it's always like downhill slide. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, me too. I have, to I have to hear the voice. Though for my writing, most of it actually harkens back to my grandmother. Um, and I actually have a small memoir called Porch Stories which is my memory of my grandmother uh, sitting on the steps. We didn't have a porch. Grandma was from Georgia. They had porches. And she came to Pittsburgh to take care of her sons and daughters, um, children. They were my aunt and my father, both single parents. So we had stoops. We had three little steps. And grandmother would sit on the steps with me and my cousins, and she would tell stories. And that orality of her telling stories, I always try to capture that. Um, in, in my writing, to capture that sort of African-American spirit of, of talking story. No, I, I, um, that's very important in my work, I think, as well, in sort of oblique ways. Um, my book was really inspired by kind of liberation theology. I was interested that um, oppressed communities like Christianity is often pushed on them, but it has a tendency to backfire because it does have these messages in, in Christianity when you're, when you're reading the Bible about liberation and about finding your own freedom. And I remember the way Martin Luther King, I was listening to his speeches while I was writing this, um, sort of found those kind of loopholes to say, well, you know, even this religion that has been, you know, given to us um, says that what's going on is wrong, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, for, for Agnes, that's essentially what it is, is that she's so attuned. She so wants to be, a, you know, a daughter of God, as they would say in the cult, that she can't stay there. And so she's in this amazing catch-22. Um, but I have always felt that in your books, that they very much are speaking directly to you. And I think that's one of the reasons why kids resonate so much with it, is that they feel like they're listening to someone tell a story. Ah, uh, well. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. But I wonder now if anybody has any question for us. Kelly and I love to answer questions and we promise to tell the truth. <laughs> if you ask and questions if you don't have now, we're going to tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> what if you 
I said if you have questions now, we'll tell 100% the truth, we promise. Yeah, tomorrow we might not, no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Jules, you want to talk a little bit about what you're working on next? Uh, I actually uh, started, um, well, I started another novel about climate change. And actually right now it's called Paradise on Fire. I was living in California when they had the Paradise Fires. And there were two novel ideas that I was interested in and I decided to go with fire. And literally uh, the book, I sent it, I finished it, you know, and sent it off to my editor just as California, Oregon and Washington state where I'm living now uh, started having, you know, the tumult of all these horrific wildfires. So the story uh, became timely, like your pandemic novel in a way came more timely than any way that I possibly could have imagined. And so actually right now I'm doing the very final, final revisions on the novel and I'm actually upping the ante that there are things now about the crisis that because I hadn't experienced it as so severely as I have recently, I didn't know that like right that the smog could be the fog, the fog of smoke could be so great that literally outside my window where I can see a lake, that there were 10 days where literally I couldn't see anything outside the window. And I know that it's far worse uh, for Portland and far worse, had been far worse in in California. I didn't know such a thing that there were fireballs that had never entered, you know, my my imagination. And so the the issue of and depth of what it's like to respond in a time of wildfire has taken on a, a a great new urgency and I'm adding more details. So generally it'd been about, you know, six kids who were surviving the wildfire. They were black kids who were on a city program that shipped them out to California to learn about nature and horseback riding and, you know, hiking and all that kind of stuff. And so they're already outside their characters and they become, you know, really, really good at that. But as they fight to survive in the wildfire, I now have foreshadowing for, there's a town there and a little boy that waves at them. And, and so that repercussions of what happened to that town. So it's, it's final layering um, much more about the seriousness of wildfires. It already had the information about how we're losing the Amazon, how, you know, uh, we have great, you know, insect infestations now because of the drought and because of the heat, you know, and yes, we have wildfires, but I think I didn't quite up the ante enough on the urgency and the desperation of what the fires themselves can do to people. So that's what I'm adding to the novel right now. And we have a question for you, Jewel, which was your favorite book to write? (laughs) Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's like, you know, mom says, you know, I love all my children. And of course you do. I love all my books, but of my children's books, I would say Ninth Ward was my favorite because something that I had waited for for over 30 years, finally in response to Katrina, I thought immediately, what about the children? What about the animals? And when Lanisha's voice came to me, it was like, I felt as though I was going to finally have a chance to live my dream to be a writer for youth. And so that means a great deal to me. The other book that I would say that I'm really proud of is in fact, uh, Ghost Boys. Ghost Boys is a very slim book, um, but it took me two and a half years to write. And it was clearly a book that I did not think that I could write about, about Emmett Till, who was murdered when I was one. Um, and the murder of so many young black youth. So I would write a bit, then cry for weeks, write a bit (laughs) and cry for weeks. And the story came out of me. So I would say in terms of accomplishment, I did it. And actually at the end of Ghost Boys, it was a child who led me, my main character, Jerome, because I still wasn't finished, I would make it through. But he led me to that moment of affirmation, that moment of love that could embrace possibilities of a future that would be better. So I'm really proud of that. But Ninth Ward will always be special because that opened the door um, to what I always wanted to do. And besides, I like Mama Yaya. So for those of you who read maybe more than one of my books, all of them except for Black Brother, (laughs) 
will have an elderly black woman uh, who's based on my real life grandmother. She might be a school teacher. She might be, um, you know, a grandmother. Uh, she might be in, in the story, you know, just sort of a, a neighbor, an elder neighbor. Uh, but I'm always sort of tipping my hat to my grandmother who raised me. Thank you for the question. That was a great question. That was a great question. Is, was there another? No. I uh, know that's the only one so far. Feel free to chime in anytime, you guys. Uh, okay. Well, I wanted to, well, I'll ask you this. Um, Kelly, I know that you've been reading and writing since you were like, just like forever, just forever, 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 forever. Did you ever want to do anything else? And oh man, I listen, I I know, I know. She like when she when she wanted to, when I was in the cradle and you tell the story about how you wanted to tell me not to give up on my dreams, I know it seems like I took that very literally. <laughs> <laughs> I I know. I it, um I think I I always wanted to write. It was just I saw you doing it and I and I um it had such a mystique. And, loved reading. and I loved reading yeah. and it was like the place that I felt the most safe and the place that I felt able to explore um, difficult ideas. Even now I, I'm writing a book um, called Mirror Girls, which um, has been sort of all finalized and it will come out from Little Brown. Um, but it's, um, I was writing it, I started it in the spring and then we had the protests after George Floyd's murder. murder and um, we had Breonna Taylor and we had so much happen and it became very much a place I was writing in the Jim Crow South and I was writing about a protest. It became a way for me to channel my emotions um, in a way that was safe, in a way that was cathartic. Um, and I really, I don't know how I would have gotten through the summer without, without that. So for me, writing has almost a therapeutic co component at this point. Um, but we got a couple more questions in. Someone says, I love Ninth Ward. I also love Ninth Ward, you guys. <laughs> like Ninth Ward is amazing. Um, and a question for both of you: What mm -hmm. tips would you give a young aspiring writer? Um, you want to take that one first? Me. Um, well, actually, a society that I've just become, been made aware of because of Kelly uh, is called the Young Inklings. So younginklings.org, which actually uh, provides one-on-one -on -one mentoring for writers. I wish I would have had that. But for young writers, the big thing is for them to want um, to be kind to themselves. Sometimes young writers will feel as though, oh, I got, I didn't finish it, you know, or they'll get start something else, and they'll see not finishing something as a failure. And actually, the ability to finish longer and longer projects, I think, actually develops with age. So to be practicing and starting over, or now I'm going to do this, I think is all healthy experimentation, and they should be very much proud of that. You don't need to write every day for hours, but even 20 minutes, you know, three times a week, you know, for developing your imagination, journaling can help, or just being aware of what you see and really paying attention to what you see out into the world. You know, the butterfly, the trees, you know, the way that the water looks at, at sunset, and also listening to voices. Like I think the best skill a writer can have is dialogue. And dialogue, you'll find that, you know, if if you try to write it in standard English, it doesn't work at all. But if you listen to people, you'll fit, you'll learn what well, people go, you know, and, uh, you know, pause, and then somebody will say, you know, something that triggers something else. And then you're not really talking about the same thing. It's just wonderful blend. But <laughs> anyway, that might be a little bit too yeah, advanced. She can, she can but, teach a whole dialogue class. And in fact, she has, and it involves yeah, do, um, dialogue some classes, pretty great, some pretty great things. But the Society of Young Inklings, I just became a mentor with them this yeah. summer. So whoever asked that question, um, you know, we, we just opened a scholarship program for, for kids. There's a program for, you know, drafting a novel. It's called the Your Novel Lab. Um, and we walk students through the process of coming up with the world, building the characters, um, everything that they need to sort of create the world that a story must take place in. In general, I would say young aspiring writer, you know, if you're, if you're not young, young, but maybe in your 20s, be patient. Um, because while I've always loved writing, I haven't always had a story that I really needed to tell. 
there was a gap between my first book, Doormat, and my second book, Agnes at the End of the World, when I was sort of figuring out who I was and what I cared about and what I wanted to write about. Um, so I was always practicing. I was always writing. I think it was always a space of joy. Um, but I wasn't always, you know, producing something that I was ready to publish. And so it's okay. Like I got a great piece of advice from an agent. You know, my agent said, you know, just live your life and like, it will happen. And um, so that sort of Zen, Zen advice helps me to this day that it's okay yeah. to be patient, take your time. That's true. You know, for those who are young, young, as in elementary, middle school, early high school, I would suggest it is, isn't it the creativity workbook? Uh, the by Corey project yeah the creativity project yes uh, that that's a wonderful writing writing book um, and Kelly might find it on her shelves for those of you that are older uh, there's the creativity project it's a wonderful wonderful book uh, for those of you that are older like uh, adult and up I do have a writing book in fiction and nonfiction. my fiction book uh, is free within ourselves lessons for black authors. That book was actually written at a time when um, that well the, that was a thing that everybody talked about writing, but you know diverse voices were not given the support that they needed. So basically, I wrote a writing textbook, and it basically has all the good writing information about how to do certain things. It's very skill based. This is how you write better dialogue. This is how you write atmosphere. But it just so happens that the examples come from African American writers, which was a big deal at the time when the book came out. Um, so I would recommend that. But just yeah, be love yourself and know that your voice matters. You know that everybody has a story to be told and everybody should feel confident to tell that story and to have a trusted reader who can give them feedback with honesty as well as still being supportive of the development of the imagination and with one story. That's absolutely right. And I think having that supportive reader is so key and is sometimes skipped over. I mean, that's the major reason that people go to MFA programs is to have someone who's open to reading their work. But you don't have to go to an MFA program to find that person. It could be that it's your partner who loves to read living in your house. It could be um, a program like We Need Diverse Books. They have a mentorship that they offer every year to diverse writers. Um, or it could be something like Young Inklings. You know, there's there are ways to find sort of community and readership. And that's very much in value. So we have another question. What books did you both love as children and what are you both currently reading? Oh, you go first, Kelly. You go oh, first. Oh my goodness. Well, am I currently reading? <laughs> my, so I have been um, like in this pandemic for a really long time <laughs> and I have a almost four-year-old. So I mostly read parenting books. I'm embarrassed to say. The, the yeah. last um, sort of, so I'm reading Self Read, which is a, is a parenting book, but um, I'm reading uh, Tracy Dion's uh, Legendborn, um, which is a black retelling of the King Arthur myth myths. Wow. I know it's, it's perfect because I loved the King Arthur myth myths as a Me child. Too. And my first sort of rare book was um, Lamorta to Arthur. And, you know, the fully illustrated. And um, I think you guys bought that for me when I was little and it was just, I still have it on my shelf. Um, so Tracy Dion, you know, sort of was like reclaiming this for like you know, yes, yeah. African-Americans in this mythology. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful. So when I'm less stressed and not just reading parenting books, I'm reading that. Um, and then what did I love as a child? I loved high fantasy and high adventure. Robin McKinley's The Hero and the Crown was huge for me. I also loved sort of the canonical works of African-American children's literature, which include like Rolling Thunder, Hear My Cry. That was very important to sort of my development to sort of who I am today. The Watsons Go to Birmingham. Um, a book that really stuck with me that you read to me was Tuck Everlasting, ages and yeah. ages ago. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's funny. I do think that there's a special power that books have um, when children read them young to sort of shape their identities and their lives. And that's why there's a sort of a higher burden, I think, on children's writers. You'll see a lot of Twitter controversies and a lot of things going on. And it's just because, you know, what we read when we're a kid really, truly matters. So over to you. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, when, when I was a kid, and this is true, I did not read anybody who was not a white American or white uh, British, Scottish, um, you know, West, Western European person. Uh, until I was a junior in college. 
And that was by accident. I went into a library and saw a book by a black woman, uh, Gail Jones, uh, who wrote a novel called Corregidor about the slave trade. And it was like a revelation. Oh my God, I thought to myself, black women write books. And so even though I had written all the time and I still remember writing my first short story when I was in the third grade, nobody ever said you could be a writer. I never thought that I could be a writer. And actually from kindergarten through eight years of college, I never read any book written by anyone who had a different skin tone um, that was, you know, white, brown on up. And so that lack of representation was really dramatic. Having said that, there were a lot of children's books that I love that really opened up my mind and opened up my heart to human values, not just necessarily representation of my community. So I did in fact like Little Women <laughs> and Joe and Beth. I did in fact like Heidi and for Heidi it's like, whoa, I wanna live in Switzerland. I love Nancy Drew and how capable she was and how she could solve, solve different things. But I actually liked a lot of the animal stories and actually today, animal stories written for children still primarily have greater representation, like almost like four times as much representation as books for children of color. And that's true. You can look up the statistics at the Wisconsin Children's Cooperative. You might have, if you're lucky, 12, 13 percent representation of African-American, maybe 10 of Hispanic, maybe three of Asian-American, but for dogs and cats or elephants, it'll be like 50, 60% representation in children's books. But I identify with the children's books, the stories where the kids, the animals were abused and then they went on to have a happier life. Um, and that's because a part of my life, uh, I considered myself an abused kid. And so I like that sense that it would be wonderful. But the first book I ever bought for myself was, in fact, a King Arthur story. It was about Prince Valiant, and it was a comic book. Um, my family didn't have money for books, so I collected pop bottles and I could get comic books. You know, so remember Jughead? I used to read Jughead. But my favorite were the illustrated classics where they would do the Prince and the Pauper or Prince Valiant as a comic book. And Prince Valiant... I didn't realize how much it had stuck to my heart until from when I was maybe eight or nine to when I was like 26 and my husband to be asked me, what do I want to be when I grow up? And my answer quick out of my mouth was valiant. And all of a sudden my whole love and memories for valiant came rushing through and also the meaning of the word valiant. So graphic novels, that's what really got to the core of my being. That's wonderful. And, and I will say that the um, sort of representation crisis, like you lived through the brunt of it, but I still remember the day when I was a teenager and I asked you, how come black people don't write science fiction? Because that was my favorite genre at the time. I was looking for science fiction, science fiction, you know, just feed me. And but how come black people don't write it? Because you'd go to Barnes and Noble and the shelves were just covered with white male authors. And you were able to tell me women too, yeah. Yes, there were very yeah, you were able to tell me, um, you know, Octavia Butler. And now we've seen this incredible flourishing where I'm reading, you know, NK Jemison, you know, every minute that I can. And you're seeing so much representation in all these different genres and these different places and it's it's been heartening it's been a tough summer but it's been heartening to see that and it's interesting because partly too in the era in which I grew up we were also coming into the era of having women's voices being known so the feminist press was actually uh, created you know when I was still in college and my college generations we were the young professors that started with ethnic studies so I was a part of that that burgeoning so also for you know, ethnicity, but also for women. And I in particular remember the impact that Ursula Le Guin had on me to this day, because she did, you know, the wonderful left hand of darkness, but then she also did the Wizard of Ursia. And I love her short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omas. So to me, that was spe spectacular. The, the uh, Tombs of Ashwan is, is also sort of on my, the Tombs yeah. of Ashwan is on my list of sort of inspirations for this book. Um, you know, where there's a young girl with sort of magical inclinations who's in this oppressive society and has to make a choice. Um, I agree, Ursula Le Guin is magic. Yes. Is there another question? 
Um, no questions yet, but I thought. Is your question in chat? No, okay. Well, in chat, we have some amazing links in case you want to find sort of what we're, oh, here's one. Kelly, do you feel that your mother will be an inspiration for a voice in a future novel? Does she make an appearance in Agnes? <laughs> well, yes, actually she is. She does make an appearance in Agnes. You are- no, free. don't. Yes, what? I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. You are a Matilda. Yeah. I am? No you way. are. Yeah. Oh, See, for those of you writers who are writing or a memoir and you're always worried about whether well, real people in your life will they be offended because you wrote about them it is true most people don't even notice it don't even know like i used to be afraid of that too people can't even tell but no you were matilda who is the the black nurse who um is fighting a pandemic and also has time to come you know help agnes she delivers insulin to agnes and then she says agnes you gotta get out of here but i'm too busy i'm gonna send my son who's this biracial boy named danny and danny's oh. the one who gives agnes a phone and helps her get out of the cult and then matilda's very much this touchstone for agnes she is womanhood outside the cult in the cult Thank woman yeah. You should be extremely mad. <laughs> no, she's, Matilda is very oh. cool. And then in my, the book that I'm working on now, I'm working on a book called uh, Mirror Girls and um, you're a little bit Nana sometimes. Oh my goodness. That, uh, uh, you can tell she reads, she reads my books before I turn them in. And <laughs> um, there's a grandmother character who, um, See, now I'm a grandmother. I'm replacing my grandmother in your life, in Clara's life. That is so totally cool. But That's a great question. Nana. I think, Nana, that's that, that, I thank you. I never, I learned something I did not know. <laughs> you know, no one's ever asked us that question before. So I'm, I, you know, I kind of took it for granted that you knew, but no. <laughs> you know, the way she's described, I was like her frizzy hair. No. Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> that's an okay. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's okay. So Anne asks, have either of you visited any middle schools to give readings? I used to teach middle school and the children would just love you both. Oh, uh, well, I, I have visited, oh, hundreds upon hundreds of schools. And actually in this era of Zoom, I'm still doing that. So for, uh, and I just love it. As a matter of fact, when I come back, cause I'm going to be reincarnated, I'm going to come back as a fifth grade teacher. I love middle school. And on Friday, I had three middle schools back to back uh, talking about ghost boys and then talking about uh, towers falling. Uh, and for those of you who do you know teachers, um, uh, you know, if a school invites me, I, the honorarium I use to buy books for Title I school are for needy students. If a school is Title I, I'm happy to talk and meet with them for free. Or just if a school is just financially struggling, I will always, always try to accommodate no matter what. So I say, yes, probably 99.9% .9 .9 of the time. And it's a matter of scheduling. And I think it goes back to the root that if I had seen a author of color, or even when I was growing up, a, a woman, or for even for that matter, even a real life guy, you know, uh, in the Pittsburgh public schools, it would made have, have made such a difference to me, such a difference. Um, but in truth, when I go talk to middle schoolers, it's really, really cool. And they don't know it, but they give me so much back. And it's like, whoa, they just make everything better and joyful. And then I can write about my love for them in, in the novels. And then they let me hug them. Oh, that's the best. So Zoom doesn't do hugs. No, no. And and I write for, for young adults. I've never, and I actually, to this day, I have not seen my book in a bookstore, let alone sort of in the hands of, of a kid who's reading it. Um, that said, if anyone knows any young adults who might benefit from Agnes at the End of the World, you know, I'm always happy to buy it from Powell's and send it your way. Um, <laughs> and also, you know, if they, if you know of any young adults who just want to connect with another writer and feel seen by another writer that like, yes, you can do this, you can try this, or even just you can become a serious reader, um, ask for me, you know, just visit my website. I have a contact information and I'm, I'm always happy to do that. So sweet, so sweet. There, I mean, there's no like question. connecting with kids, yeah. You know, is there one final question? I saw another number or there might not be. Just, just double check. Did we catch everything? I think we caught everything. Oh, okay. 
Good, good. You can count on me and Kelly both uh, to provide any any support. And we can't wait to get to Powell's um, and get a chance maybe wait one to day see to you. Uh, yeah, give you give you guys uh, big big hugs and thank you for the honor and privilege of letting us be with you this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. It was an amazing conversation. I. It was laughing and almost crying through most of it sitting back here. So luckily I was muted. <laughs> it was lovely. So thank you. Um, and thanks for the links for kids and adults also who are writing. I know lots of kids who will really enjoy that. That's really helpful. Um, and thanks everyone out in the audience for joining us. We hope that you will buy Kelly and Jules books from Powell's or otherwise, shop independent, shop local. We need it all. Um, and we hope that you come back for other virtual events again. We, we're we really honored to have you. Thank you. It was Thank a huge you. honor for us. That you're, Thank you. That Powell's is a wonderful store. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank oh. you. Great, great. Thank Powell. you. <laughs> Thank you. Great audience. Have a wondrous day. Keep reading. Yay. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. Have a good day.